I am happy to see that there are many uh, members and participants still in the room and eager to listen to the two speakers for this um, last uh, lunch debate on uh, uh, Africa. But uh, uh, rather than uh, having a discussion on Africa in general terms, we thought with the two prominent speakers, uh, Madame uh, Aminata Touré, former Prime Minister of Senegal and who is now serving as the uh, President of the Conseil Economique et Social, Social et env Environnemental. Uh, you, you, you will tell us how you translate that into uh, English uh, or any other language. And so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madame Aminata Touré, uh, to have accepted uh, this uh, role the, uh, today. So you will speak about Senegal, I think, a, 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 a case study, a very, very interesting one, on the West, in West Africa. And for East Africa, we have the pleasure of having uh, Akebe Okube, who is, actually he has been the advisor to the Ethiopian Prime Minister, to three Ethiopian Prime Ministers, uh, and with the rank of minister, so he's minister, minister, cabinet minister, and uh, advisor uh, to the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. And by the way, we congratulate him and his Prime Minister, who, uh, as you know, won the Nobel Peace Prize a uh, few days ago. So uh, that will give us, you know, two uh, case studies, so to speak, one on West Africa, one East Africa. So thank you very much. Please come here. So we will start with the presentation of both uh, our speakers, and then, as usual, uh, Q&A session. So Aminata first. Thank you very much, Mr. Facilitator Thierry, I'd like to congratulate you for uh, this conference that uh, kept all its promises. Uh, I am the president of the Economic, Social, and Environmental Council, which is as simple as, as, simple as that, that play an advisory role uh, toward the government and the parliament. I like to talk about Senegal, give a little bit of background. It's a small country. Uh, we like to call it uh, the entry of Africa when you come from, from the USA. We are just facing New York, which wasn't a luck. That's one of the biggest uh, slave reports. Um, we are 16 million, so a small population. But we are mostly known for our political stability. We are a country of 97% of Muslim, and our first president happened to be a Christian in 1960. He's the father of the, the independence. Uh, he has been supported at that time by all religious leaders against his opponent, who himself was a Muslim, a lawyer going by the name of Lamin Gay. So what I like to show there is that we've been sort of nurturing internal cohesion and inter-religion relationship uh, quite peacefully. So we are a country, an Islamic country of tolerance and peace and it translated into, into stability and we are very, very proud of that, and we really would like to sort of nurture it and sustain it. That's the first thing I would like to say about Senegal. Second thing is the democracy. We have changed peacefully president over time. The first one, Leopold Sédar Senghor, who happened to be member of the L'Académie Française, 
uh, he spoke French so well that he has been appointed at the Académie Française, which showed the historical relationship with France. And then he has been, he resigned from power in 1981. Um, his successor, President Abdou Diouf, um, left power in 2000 after democratic elections, succeeded by President Abdoulaye Wad, who himself uh, was defeated in 2012 by the sitting president, Macky Sall, all of that in a peaceful process. So we do think that we do have a strong democracy that is ingrained in the political culture, and we work to sustain that, because it's never a given. We all have to work with it. Second thing I'd like to say about Senegal uh, we do have also a very, what we call, armée républicaine, which means an army that goes by the rule of democracy, that respects the constitution, and we never know of coup d'etat in Senegal. So that kind of defeat all the stereotype we are displaying about Africa. Uh, the army stay in its role. It's very much involved in peacekeeping operation uh, all over the world, and as we speak also in, uh, in Mali, um, we worked also in, in Gambia, the neighboring country of Gambia, and the army is very professional and uh, stand by the constitution. We also do have a very strong press. Some would say too strong. <laughs> uh, the liberty of press is a given um, with um, journalists expressing themselves in a free way. So this is what is the ingredient of the Senegalese uh, stability. When it comes to the economics, because of course, if you want to sustain that, you have to create wealth. Uh, we, have a, we are a very young country. 70% of the population is below the age of 40, which trigger um, strong challenges. Um, the most important one is related to, of course, youth employment. So President Macky Sall, when he came uh, at the, as a head of state, uh, at that time I studied with him as Minister of Justice, uh, the next year, he worked on a plan that is called Senegal Emergent, Plan Senegal Emergent. We have one of the key actors sitting here, uh, which is uh, Mubarak Lo. I have to acknowledge him. He was also part of the team. He's very known by the World Forum. He's been attending it often. Um, so he was also part of those who reflect on this plan that will start from 2013 all the way to 2035. What it shows, the length of the plan, uh, is that if you count, if you can count on a solid democracy that is ingrained in the political culture, you don't only think for yourself because we have a two-term system. Uh, you can also think for the future generation, um, ensuring that democracy will play uh, normally and whoever will be you know, at the seat as a president will be following uh, the accumulative success because that's how it is seen. This Plan Senegal Emergent, which means how to make sure that Senegal emerge um, as a developed country, uh, has two, three pillars. The first pillar is economy, as I said. It's very important to create wealth uh, for your youth, for, your, for the women. Uh, so that's the first pillar. And it has been quite successful because last year we enjoyed 6.5% economic growth. So whatever you know, we were doing, it seems to be working. Uh, because we are uh, below uh, the African average of econo economic growth, that is between 4 and 4.1 percent, and we uh, uh, enjoy 6.5 percent. So it is working. How, what happened uh, to have such a big growth? First of all, it is around good governance, making sure that um, the revenues are well spent. And they have been spent in uh, a sector that employ most of Senegalese workers, which is agriculture. So the idea was how to modernize agriculture. So a um, lot of investment uh, have been made, um, modernizing equipment, uh, moving from traditional agriculture to modernize, more mechanical agriculture. Um, so the result was that we, for instance, we grow uh, peanuts is one of our most products. Uh, we quite double um, the production in six years. Um, so that contributed uh, to the growth. Um, infrastructure, 
there have been um, immense infrastructure to close the gap between urban areas and rural areas, because that's also one, the, one of the challenges we've been having. When the colonizer came, they focus on the cities, because that's where they used to live and how they organize you know, the, 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 the economy. Um, so the, the, there is a huge gap most of the time between the rural places and urban. When you come in you know, African cities, you can enjoy a lifestyle, uh, comfortable, but you drive maybe 10 kilometers further, you are in rural Africa and you, see, you can see the gap. So President Sal was very, very, very keen on uh, bridging the gap and he came up with uh, what we call a capture plan, rural plan, and by investing in uh, roads, in access to water, by the way, Senegal is going to achieve universal access to water, and we are hopeful that in four years we will even achieve universal access to electricity. So all of that put together trigger more production, um, and uh, you, that's what explains uh, this, uh, this growth. Of course, he also invested in, in fishery, because we are a fishing country. We have 800 uh, kilometers of coast, and I'll talk about the challenges related to environment. Um, so he also subsidized uh, production, trying also to modernize uh, fishery e equipment and small boats. Um, so that also increased the production uh, in that sector. The second pillar is about human development. If you have an economy, you have resources, by the way, Senegal is going to be an uh, oil and gas uh, producing country. Uh, we are very happy about that. And I also like to point out, um, we have uh, Mohammed is here, one of our Mauritanian friends. Um, the gas was discovered at the, at the border between Mauritania and Senegal, but in high sea. Um, so where is the, the well? Well, it could be you know, more in the Mauritanian side or a little bit in the Mauritanian Senegalese side. So what the two presidents, former president Aziz, and he has to be praised for that, and uh, President Sal too has to be praised for that, they sat down and agreed that we're gonna do 50-50. I think we didn't talk a lot about it, but this is sort of a, a very positive way of solving issues in Africa. We know that a lot of wars and turmoils uh, arise in this kind of situation where everybody wanna sort of uh, take advantage, but they come up and decide that it's gonna be 50-50. So I think this is a good lesson learned and a good case study uh, to, be, to, be, to be published. Um, so human capital was very, very, very strong on that. Um, President Maxal came up with creating universities, but investing also in a quality education, uh, primary to secondary level, because we also still uh, have huge gap in terms of you know, schooling, um, but we made a lot of progress. This year, for instance, there were more female um, sitting for examination to go to secondary school than, than male. Uh, in a 96% Muslim country, uh, that's a huge advancement. Um, where women are more uh, sort of uh, um, present in schooling uh, than men at the primary. Um, but of course, as we go, uh, there are some social challenges and you, you find fewer women maybe in the universities. But there is a nice trend that is being built and designed. Uh, so that is also very, very supported. In the human capital, there is also a decision. We do have what we call la délégation à l'entrepreneuriat rapide. I would translate it in sort of a window, financial window, to support especially uh, women and, and youth in terms of promoting entrepreneurship and supporting small projects and, and, and small enterprises. And a huge amount of money has been put in um, that, that strategy. So that's the second pillar, how the country is going to build quality human resources, um, including women and, 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 and young people, so you can support your economic plan. Because most of the time you do have the gap. You would see the opportunities in mining, in gas, etc. But on the other hand, you would not see quality uh, human resources uh, to be in a, in a, in a situation of, uh, of, of good management. So that also is part of the plan. So that was the second pillar. And the third one, which is equally important, that's good governance. And I think Senegal has been recognized as one of the good countries trying to really promote good, good governance. Uh, we uh, had a recognition from 
uh, more Hebraim uh, index. We made huge progress. Uh, we still have challenges, of course, um, but that is one of the priority of President Makisal and his government. And in this third pillar, of course, there is cooperation. And cooperation at different level, um, whether it's at the regional level, sub-regional, I would say, ECOWAS, um, that's the Economic Commission for West African countries. We are very interrelated, um, and we do have a common market. We have the common currency, the CEFA, which we inherited from our relationship, ancient relationship with France. And I must say there is a debate also in countries as whether we should start um, reflecting on our own currency, but that's ongoing debates, and we are doing it also with our, with our partners. And then you do have uh, the African uh, market, which is the bigger, meaning uh, through um, what, is, uh, what happened uh, recently, the African uh, zone, uh, trade zone, uh, which will present Africa as the biggest common market, actually. We didn't speak a lot about it, but it's going to be one of the biggest common markets. Uh, the head of state agreed upon it, so I think uh, it's opportunity to commerce within ourselves because this is also one of the priority, the, one of the, the, the challenges in, in Africa. We don't trade much within ourselves. It's between less than 10% intra-Africa trading. Although if you go to Asia or even to Europe, it might be up to 70%. So with this common zone of trading, uh, we should be uh, moving forward. Um, yes, there is some, of course I have to talk about the challenges. The challenges I talked about it, it's a youth employment. Youth employment and we have a gap in terms of industrialization. That's uh, for his second term, one of the priority of President Macky Sall. How are we going to import less goods and manufacture them uh, here in Senegal? I think Ethiopia is doing a good work. That's also what we would like to do. Second is environment. I talk about the 800 kilometers of coast. We are seeing uh, sea, you know, sort of invading um, some of our, the, the lands, and it's also an issue, a challenge that we are trying to face. And of course, security, not within Senegal, but as a sub-regional uh, concern. We do know the situation of Nigeria, terrorism, of, of Mali, and it's closer and closer to Senegal. And we are also an actor because we are supporting our Malian friends. But that's also a concern uh, that we have to list among the challenges. And what are the, the way forward? The way forward is really building upon our experience, building stronger institutions. I think when it comes to the political process in Senegal, it's already well ingrained. And uh, that's uh, one of the, the given good governance and, of course, use at the center of whatever we are doing. Because as I said, that's 70% of our citizen and whatever policy is being developed, it has to be centered, uh, youth centers and women centers. When you take both groups, it's 70% of the population. And in a place like this one, we also have to talk about cooperation. How are we going to sort of develop stronger links uh, within our traditional friends, of course. I talked about the relationship very ancient relationship with France, but as I say, it's starting also in ECOWAS, how are we going to have a common vision um, on these issues, of course, on a win-win uh, basis. Um, I do think that there is a, there is a, there, there's been a history and there will be a, a future of our relationship. Um, and of course, opening up to Africa and to the rest of the world. I could speak on and on and on, but I think I'm gonna leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aminata. It was fascinating, and uh, I was about to say we are all Senegalians now, but are we also all Ethiopians, RKB? Uh, so the floor is yours, and uh, I would like to say about you also that you are the author or the editor of a number of very important books, not only in Ethiopia, but uh, also on uh, economic development uh, in, in a large sense. So the floor is yours. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Siri. Uh, first, I have to, to thank you and express uh, my appreciation for the great 
work uh, that contributes to uh, creating a new way of understanding of global issues. And I'm referring to the contribution of uh, IFRI and the World Policy Conference, which I have found to be quite, quite important contribution. So we thank you for, for this, and uh, I would ask the, my colleagues here to applaud for the great job uh, Thierry had done. It's now considered as one of the leading think tanks, although we know that um, most of the leading think tanks are in the US, and, and, uh, and this is being ranked as one of the leading global think tanks, and um, I'm really uh, happy about this. And uh, I also congratulate my sister Aminta for the great job our Singapore colleagues are doing, and uh, maybe one of the few female uh, uh, prime ministers, uh, and uh, I congratulate you, Aminta. So let me start with the point Sherry raised. Are we all Ethiopians? This was a question. And the answer is yes. And they have a good reason. The human origin comes from Lucy. Lucy is founded in Ethiopia, and its uh, human remain 3.5 million years old. And this is in Ethiopia. So your origin, uh, your grand, 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 grandparents are from Lucy, Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is also known for being one of the first countries who accepted Judaism. That's why there are Ethiopian Jews, and this is, uh, goes far beyond uh, the uh, before Christ. Uh, then Ethiopia is also, we're talking with Aminta, uh, one of the, actually, one of the oldest Muslim countries. The first mosque was built in the seventh century, and followers of, Mo followers of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, when they were not welcomed in Saudi, the Ethiopian king at that time, Nugus, welcomed them. They, he, they settled. He gave them land. He was a Christian king, and since then, even Prophet Muhammad said that every Muslim should never, should never uh, 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 declare war on Ethiopia. And, and this makes it the oldest uh, Muslim country. But it's also one of the oldest Christian countries. Christianity have a long history. Uh, so we are a very diverse uh, society in terms of religion, and, uh, but people tolerate each other, and in some places, Muslims and Christians also marry each other. We are also a diverse society. Uh, so uh, coming back to the prestigious uh, award our Prime Minister has received, I would like to say a few words about this issue. One of the main reasons that our Prime Minister was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize was he took a very bold initiative to end a 20 years old uh, war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, which may not be politically popular, and uh, without major intermediaries, the two leaders met and agreed to make a peace and our Prime Minister took uh, the first initiative. And uh, now Ethiopia and Eritrea are in peace, and we also appreciate all friends who facilitated uh, this uh, great peace, including Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, UAE, and, and other leaders. Our Prime Minister also, one of the first initiatives was uh, he traveled to Cairo and directly appeal to the Egyptian people that Ethiopia is committed for a peace 
with Egypt and that uh, Grand Renaissance Dam is also to be built with the common interest in mind. So he uh, also made it clear that we need to closely work together. So peace has been a major focus of our prime minister in the area. The second uh, reform our prime minister had focused was on governance issue. Uh, one of the changes in our uh, political system or government has been uh, an increased involvement of uh, female. And here now our uh, president is President Salwark, a female president. The supreme judge is female, Maza, Judge Maza. And 50% of the cabinet members are also female. And also the speaker of the House of Federation is a female. Female are good to lead a country. And of course, we can learn from the Germans. Merkel, we can see uh, the first leader who has been able to, uh, to, to be in chancellor's position for a long time. So this has been a major uh, intervention in the governance area and also additional economic reforms. But the key point is, why is Ethiopia raised, uh, the name of Ethiopia raised in, in many platforms? And there is one, one important reason. Since 1991, Ethiopia has been able to, to initiate a very fast economic growth. The country is big in population, and uh, between 1975 and 1991, during the military regime, uh, the economy was stagnant, and we had a big war. And after, in the 90s, a new constitution was adopted, a multi-party system was adopted, and the country focused on recovery. So it's now considered by IMF and the World Bank as the fastest growing economy because the economy has been growing by 10.5% for continuous 15 years. And this has been twice Africa's average growth rate, which was about uh, 5 to 5.5%. And this has been one of the key recognition of uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia does not have petroleum, does not have diamond big resources, and this entire growth was achieved especially by the hardworking people of uh, Ethiopia and Ethiopia also focused to attract uh, investment. In terms of uh, uh, social indicators or improvement of uh, uh, the livelihood of uh, the people, there has been some significant, not sufficient, but the achievement has been quite, quite, uh, quite important. A key indicator while going, while not talking about education, health, uh, food security, etc. one critical indicator is the uh, average life expectancy. If people are able to live longer, it means there is relatively better improved health services, improved food security, education, etc. So the key progress in this respect was in 1991, the average life expectancy in Ethiopia was 44. And Africa's average life expectancy was 50, whereby 10 years uh, behind Africa's average. In 2016, the average life expectancy in Ethiopia has reached 66 which is a 21 years increment in average life expectancy and compared with Africa's average in, 19, in uh, 2016, which was 60, uh, this is twice uh, the average increment. And this is an important indicator because growth has to benefit uh, the public. However, the country has also been focused on improving uh, and focusing also on long-term investment. One key area where the country has focused was on education. But 
not education, pr uh, primary schools only. In primary schools now, we have 30 million population are studying in primary schools. We have big population. It's the second populous country in Africa, 100 million. And every year, the population is growing by 2 million. 2 million are usually uh, to give an indication, the significance, I always say, say that uh, the population grows every year, means twice the size of Mauritius every single year. So here, education becomes quite critical. The most important education reform Ethiopia conducted was the transformation of university systems and the introduction of technical schools. And in transforming the universities and technical schools, we tried to see alternative systems and we found out that uh, the German system is more appropriate to us, the, especially the apprenticeship system of technical schools. So for the last 15 years, we have had a reform transforming the system and currently the number of technical schools has increased from three schools in 1991 to 1,300 technical schools who can train one million technicians every single year. The second major expansion and transformation has been in university system. We only had three universities and the intake capacity was only 5,000. With the reform made, this has increased now to 50 public universities in addition to hundreds of uh, private colleges and universities. And also the number of students in public universities has reached half a million. And every year we have 100,000 uh, university graduates from public, from public universities. But more importantly, the major change was the university education had focused on social sciences and humanities. While economics is important, linguistics is important, but for rapid economic transformation, engineering is important and technology is critical. So the major shift has been from 85% social sciences and humanities courses, we shifted to 70% in natural science, technology, and engineering. And from this 70%, 40% has to be in engineering. And we have basically achieved to uh, this uh, level, and uh, we had to train thousands of lecturers with PhD, and the government also spent a lot of money on this. We brought in 500 Germans, and as you know, the Germans are expensive, uh, and all this, uh, their salary was paid by our treasury. We wanted their technical skills. So education and human capital has been a prime focus. Second prime focus has been infrastructure. You cannot sustain rapid economy grows without infrastructure. However, infrastructure is not a quick fix. Building a hydro power has a long gestation period. At least you need minimum 10 years from inception to completion. So you have to think uh, long term. And Ethiopia had focused on infrastructure, building energy, uh, expanding highways, expanding rural roads, now building electric powered railway systems. And our government has been spending close to 50% of its federal budget on expansion of universities, I mean uh, infrastructure. This has helped us to attract more investment. In the last six, seven years, the FDI is increasing, inflow is increasing in Ethiopia. In 2017, the Ethiopia had, uh, was the, one of the major destinations of FDI in Africa, an increment of 
uh, 50% that year. Between 2012 and 2017, the FDI size has increased by four times. And the key aspect is 89% of all FDI inflow to Ethiopia has been in manufacturing. And I should like to note on this occasion a misperception that it's only the Chinese who are investing in Ethiopia. That's not the case. If you look at infrastructure, one of the major infrastructure projects, for instance, is being built by uh, a Turkish company, railway company, and it has been financed by Credit Suisse and the consortium of many banks from Europe. European Investment Bank has been financing important infrastructure. On the investment side, in some sectors, it's mainly Europeans who have dominated specific sectors. At floriculture, a very dynamic sector for exports, uh, it has been dominated entirely by Europeans, and there is not even a single Chinese. In food and beverage, the major investors are uh, Europeans. So in brewery industry, which is growing fast, and it's growing at uh, a rate of 25% every single year, uh, we find uh, companies like Diageo from UK, Castiel Group from France, uh, Bavaria from, and Henneken from Holland, and other companies also from Germany. So I would like to highlight that the government is continuously improving the business climate. And you can, when you invest in Ethiopia, you can also find the right type of skills from university graduates to technicians. One of the good things is that uh, Although French is not widely spoken, but English is widely spoken, which makes it easy for know-how transfer. So these are the few points I would like to highlight. I would also like to add, as it's important to indicate, uh, that the European and African partnership is important. And here, a good initiative by G20 and also many European uh, countries is the G20 compact with Africa. And Ethiopia is one of the uh, few countries selected to be part of this process. If I am not mistaken, also Senegal is part of this uh, priority list. So this is an opening that will encourage a broader partnership between our continent and, uh, and Europe. I was at... Uh, uh, one of the ports of Morocco, uh, and it's just 15 kilometers away from Europe. So these two continents are basically like one big region. And it's very important to think of the potential of this continent. Now the population of Africa is 1.2 billion. By 2050, it's going to increase to 2.5 billion. 25% of the world's population will be living in Africa. By year 2100 or 2100, after eight years, 4.5 billion population will be living in Africa, which is going to be 35%. This is a challenge a challenge for job creation, because currently now Africa needs to create 20 million jobs every single year, minimum. But this is also a huge opportunity. This is a demand. This is a market. This is a new economic opportunity. This is also a source for productive investment. Productions could be, facilities could be established in Africa, and, and this could also contribute to competitiveness of uh, foreign companies.
Well, thank you very much, RTB. This is also a fascinating uh, presentation, and I think we heard about two uh, highly successful uh, cases uh, illustrating, like the other day uh, about Rwanda, that uh, Africa uh, has a huge potential for development. I gave the speakers, I think, a bit of extra time uh, so that I think it is not possible to have a, a, a discussion now. So I uh, just want to thank you, uh, Aminata and Arkebe. Uh, we learned a lot. Thank you very much. Et à tout à l'heure.